Okay, I'll have a little prayer to start with. Father, thank you for the day. As always, I request that you be with us in our reading. Speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, last week, uh, by way of review, just to kind of set the stage, uh, Paul has written, reminding the people reading this letter, uh, that uh, he had a calling, a special calling from God. Uh, he's cleared up the mystery in a sense that Jesus is the Christ and Jesus welcomes not only the Jews, but he also welcomes the Gentiles. And that's a key statement to think about. Uh, when he met the Lord, I mentioned last week, he really never got over that meeting. He became just as enthusiastic about the Lord Jesus as he was in fighting him prior to that encounter. And he becomes a dynamic person that Jesus uses, God uses to call the Gentile. But at the same time, he is also a Jew. And so he didn't forget the Jews. And if you've read Acts, you might recall the fact that everywhere Paul went, Luke records he went to the Jew first, and then to the Gentiles. So though he welcomed the Gentiles, made a way for us, he also was true in the sense that he called the Jewish people too. And that was his calling, so he talks about that. And it's going to lead into the fact uh, that he prays for them. Not only should they remember he had a calling, he is telling them, you also have a calling. I don't know what your calling is. We're going to get into that a little bit later. But each one of us tonight, as we talk and think, we've all been called of God. And we've made an initial answer to that call uh, when we said, yes, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And when we were baptized, uh, when we were buried with Christ, we died, we were buried, we were raised, and we were new people. May not have realized all of that, but that's exactly what took place. And so this is the calling. And so this man says, I fulfill my calling. And I want you to do the same. You have been called. So do the same as I have done. Whatever your calling might be, you are to answer that by the way you live. And we'll, as I said, get into that in just a few minutes. But then there was also something else he said that I think very important, and I mentioned last week. For he says, also remember that I spend time praying for you. And I want to pray for you along these lines. I want you to have inner strength. Inner strength. The ability to say no to Satan. Now, Satan knows us as well or better than we know ourselves. He knows exactly what buttons to push. They get a response from us. He knows what, he knows us. And so we try to fight him. And he is saying, remember now, you have strength that other people don't have. You have inner strength. You have Holy Spirit strength. Now you're going to have to be open to him. And you have to be open to that fact. Just like he also says, I want you to understand how much God loves you. You have to be open to that. Just like this inner strength, the love of God, you have to be open to it. You have to experience it. And then you begin to see. Now that don't mean that you'll always do what you're supposed to do, but it means that you can. And so he says, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying for you. Not only do we pray for ourselves, we pray for others. And so he's saying that uh, I pray for you. Uh, some of you might remember Brother Bob Neal. I've mentioned him before. He used to be one of the key men at Brentwood Hills. I'm talking way, way back. Then he went to Brentwood and then came back in his later days uh, to Brentwood Hills. And uh, I've had him tell me, he said to me one, one occasion, I know he's done that for, I don't know how many, Carl, I pray for you every day. Every day, 
I present your name to holy God. And that does something to you. Because I know Bob well enough, I knew him well enough, to know that when he said, I pray for you, he prayed for me. And so Paul is saying, I love you, and I pray for you. And I want you to know I pray for you, because you can experience this thing. The Holy Spirit's in you, and the Spirit's in me, and that we relate to one another. And God loves you, and you need to experience that, know about that. And then he goes on to say that God can really do more for you than you can imagine. He can do more for you than you ever dreamed. And so he's in us, he helps us, he's with us, he loves us, and he's trying to get us to understand that uh, he does things for us. I am conscious of the fact, and I think you are too, uh, that's the reason I mentioned Sunday night. I, I have felt all along that God is with his church. And it seemed evident to me uh, when some of us met with those elders a week or so ago and uh, they were questioning and we talked seriously about the Spirit of God being among the people, in the people at, at Nolan Hill. And uh, it, it's evident and I think God will do more for us than we can imagine. I think he is doing great things for us. So with that in mind, we move into the next chapter, chapter four. And he says something that kind of surprises you. I guess it depends on uh, what translation you use. But he says, uh, I'm begging you. I want you to do something for me. I'm, I'm actually begging you. I don't know whether I've said that to many people, but there have been times when I have literally begged somebody to do something. And I know I have God. I know there have been times when I made a plea. Please answer my prayer. I am begging you. I'm begging you to do this. I'm asking you as your son, please do this. So, Paul says to them, and, and so from the way we're reading, he says to us, to each one of us, I am begging you to lead lives worthy of your calling. And that's what I said in the beginning. We're going to get to that. I don't know how God has called you, how you heard him. I've talked to you before about the fact that I've, Sometimes I answer in a foolish way, I guess. Uh, when people say, have you ever heard the voice of God? My answer has always been yes, no, or no, yes. Uh, I've never heard an audible voice. I've heard an inner voice. I've heard. I knew it was God who was speaking to me. Uh, in my life, in the, when I was in the 12th grade, I had always planned to go into business with my daddy. That was my plans. He had started the Mac Pest Control. And uh, he and I talked about having an office in a certain building in, in Nashville and, and uh, the dreams we had. And I came under the influence of Dr. Joe Sanders at the Jackson Bart Church of Christ. And through him, I heard the call of God on my life to change and to tell my daddy that I was not going to do that that uh, I was going to become a preacher. And that came out of nowhere for me. I never thought about that personally. And uh, I do believe that people are called to ministry. They are called to certain things. But that means that all of us who belong to God are called to something. And we'll talk more about it as we go along. Try to live a life that's worthy of who you are. So we started out, and I've been talking about this all along, the idea that tonight I'm talking to a son or a daughter, the whole group. Most of us, I'm sure all of us, may well be in the family of God. We were called there first. I had been called to answer Jesus' call on my life to become one of the children of God through the blood 
that he shed for me. And so he's saying, now I want you to live a life worthy of that. That was a sacrifice. We often talk about the sacrifice of Jesus and what that really means. <coughs> that he sacrificed himself for me. And then he goes on to explain this. Paul doesn't miss much. <coughs> Excuse me. He didn't miss much. So he says, let me, let me talk to you a little bit about what I mean. For example, if you're going to live a life worthy of your calling, you're going to have to have humility. And we make a joke out of that a lot of times. I'm, you know, I'm proud of my humility. And, and we, we say a lot of things about humility. I'm just such a humble person. Uh, uh, Joyce played a sermon I heard part this morning that I preached, I don't know, four or five years ago uh, at the lectures at Lipscomb and uh, it was uh, the idea right along these lines that I, I said, it's, I'm, I'm reading something to you about humility, and yet at the same time I'm having a problem because I don't want to be the worst speaker on the program. I would like to do a pretty good job so that you might think I did a good job. So I'm, I'm having to combat this concept of too much pride and humility. But he said, I want you to be humble people. And then he said gentleness, and there's another one right there. I'm not always the most gentle person in the world, <coughs> right? <laughs> I'm not the most gentle person. Sometimes I am. Uh, uh, so I do with my little kids. I can be, but I can also be different than gentle. Uh, I like, I, that's, and yet that's one of my favorite words. To be a gentleman, the true meaning of gentleman. I love that word. Uh, I, I tell a story about Anton. You might have heard it. If you've heard me, you've heard it somewhere. Uh, when he was a little thing, I used to tell him every Sunday when he was going to uh, to Bolte, we he'd go out with me and stand in the foyer and I'd greet the people. I said, uh, they'd ask him how he's doing. And I said, tell him you're a caballero. You are a gentleman. And so usually he did that. And then one day, Brother Tom Tarver came out and said, how are you doing? I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm Superman. And I said, Superman? I thought you was a caballero. No, I'm Superman today. And so that hit me pretty hard to think about what he was really saying to me, at least, to help me. Some days I think I'm Superman. Some days I think I'm Superman. Man, and I need always to be gentle, man, and I'm not. And yet, there is what he's saying to me: be careful about all this. Uh, you you need to think about other people. You need to think about other people. And so he's this is what he's saying. And so there's a reason for all this. He is saying to us that uh, we're going to have to live together. That takes humility. Those of us who are now, especially with me being a new member of Nolan Hills, i got to live with you all. And you have to live with me. And in order for us to accomplish, in order for us to be what we can be, Paul is saying directly to us humility. He's saying patience. He's saying think about other people. He's saying you're going to have to get along. Now that, that doesn't mean that we're going to all agree 100% all the time. But we're going to have to be the kind of people who can listen and uh, live together in peace in harmony, in the spirit. And he says, and my question is always, well, why? You know, I, I, you know I, I'll try my best. Why? Well, there's a reason. And he goes into it. And I don't know that I ever thought about today why he was really saying all that. But here's the reason when he goes into all those ones. The reason, I say, well, why? 
Do I have to be such a gentleman? Why do I have to get along with you? Why? And he says, because that's, that's it. It's just, there's no other way. We're family. We may have a little bit of a trouble of falling out, but the love covers this. You got to get and share with one another. He said, we're just one body. There's not two or three or four bodies. This book is about the church in a sense. And so he compares the church as a body. He said, it's just one body. Just one body. Now, it's made up of a lot of members. Hand, fingers, fingernails, eyes, ears, nose, mouth. We all have a part to play, function to do. And, and I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm a nose, I'm not speaking to an ear because I'm upset with it. And then he says, I'm just not going to listen to anything. And the nose may say, well, I may drip on you then. I, it's just the fact that you, you got to have, he says, it makes sense. We get along. Even when we get upset, we have to go back and say, I'm sorry. Why? Because it's just one body. That's just one. And then he goes on to say, how many spirits do you think there will be? We're all filled with the same spirit, Jew, Gentile alike. Just one spirit. One spirit. That's all it is. He can't live with you if you force him out. He can't do for you if you force him out by being somebody who's too proud. Or, you know, he says, how many hopes you have? One hope. In Jesus, my hope is wrapped up in Jesus. One hope, one Lord, one faith. Can't be a bunch of faiths. Faith in Jehovah God. Faith in Jesus God. Faith in Holy Spirit God. He said there's one baptism. They're not different kinds of baptism. There's just one baptism. And he says there's one body, one church. His church. Now the key to that is it's his, not mine. He adds to it those who are being saved. I don't know how, who they are. I don't know all the people in that group. He's the one that puts them in there. Not I. Not I. He makes those decisions. But he says, as you break it down and live in congregations, in neighborhoods in a sense, then by being the kind of person who gets along with others or, or who shares what he has and, and does what he needs to do that's what it's all about that's what it's, uh, it's just live up to the calling of who you are and he puts it that way now i want to i want you to think about that and i want to stop there for just a little bit and that takes us through uh verse seven eight of that chapter so let me ask you as i always do what are you hearing what are you thinking what are you reflecting on right now? Am, am I making any sense to you? And then we'll break it down just a little bit more before we quit. But let's pause long enough for you to respond and tell me what you're hearing and what I'm talking about, what I'm saying. Or maybe I'm not clear, so ask a question, whatever. But let me hear so I know what direction to take. Well, just thinking about the, uh, you know, verse two, being humble and gentle, you know, I, I think about, you know, s stuff that happens at work, for instance, you know, if, if everyone was, had just a, an ounce more of hum humility and, and gentleness, you know, little, you know, quarrels and stuff wouldn't happen. Nice. And, um, same thing at home or in the church, but that's, you know, the, having that humility is probably one of the hardest things to have. So yeah. I don't know. And yet you call, we are, I am, you are called on to develop that because in another place, Paul says, as much as life in you, live at peace with all men, which would indicate what? Think about that. There are some people you can't live at peace with as much as it's as much as you can cause peace to happen there are times when you can't cause peace to last so 
you don't have the power, the position, or the strength, or you are dealing with some people who just don't care. So, but it puts it on you to do what you can to live in perfect harmony with people. It's the same thing in marriage. It's the kind of thing you have to have some give and take. And uh, you have to listen. You have to not always get your way. Uh, I used to say that I've never been wrong, I mean, never been right at work or home. Because Joyce was always right, and my secretary was always right. And so between the two of them, I never made a right decision yet. But I, that was a joke, surely. I got one right. But anyway, it was the fact that uh, uh, it's, it's who we are. We have to be careful. And he said, I'm begging you to give some thought to this. And so tonight, I'm begging you. I'm begging myself. Let's give some serious thought to this thing of we're trying to grow. We're trying to develop. We're trying to reach people. How's the best way to do it? Love them. Treat them nice. Speak gently. Most of the time, people respond in kind. And so that puts it to us again. How I say it, what I say, and uh, how I deal with people. I, I'm a bottom line person. I'm not much for chit chat. I, I've been in meetings all my life and, and everybody wants to put a lot of fluff and I just want to get to the bottom line so I can get to something else. And so I have to be careful of what I say or how I say it. But I don't need a lot of compliments. Just tell me what you want. What are we doing? What's the bottom line? What are we doing here? And most times it's either money or a favor or something. So don't tell me how great I am to try to get it. Just tell me what you want. But being a Christian means I might have to sit back and listen a little while. Because that person wants to talk some. And that, that, who I am, I have to change. I may have to make some adjustments. Somebody else talk to me. I like the uh, second part of that, chat, uh, that verse number two. Um, it says, you know, it says, be humble, be gentle. But then it also says, uh, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. And the second part, making allowance for faults, that's completely countercultural right now. Um, oh, goodness, there, yes. There is no grace for anybody else's faults. It's imme you're immediately called out if you're not doing what the, you know, flow wants to do and there's no patience for you. Um, so that's, that's needed nowadays more than anything, I think. Uh, this morning, that sermon I was listening to that I preached to some years back, I used an illustration and I'm sure you've heard it somewhere. Uh, there was a gentleman at Volte years back. Uh, he was an immigrant. He worked downtown. Uh, uh, he was a good man, I'm sure, in many, many ways, but he had a habit that just tore me all to pieces. He was, old. he was an older man at that time, and I wasn't as old as I am now. But I'd go over to the building every Sunday, and this man would come up to shake hands with me, and if I was talking to somebody else or doing something, he'd hit me across the shins with his walking stick. And then he'd stick out his hand to uh, shake hands with me and say, good morning, Brother McKill. Uh, it was a hard thing for me to live with that. And I remember I told Joyce one Sunday if he, after about a year of it, that if he hit me this morning when we go over, I'm going to take the stick and beat him to death. And I said the Lord was with me because he hit me, as always. And I stuck his hand out, and I shook it. But that was a hard thing because that, and he didn't mean a thing by it. He didn't know that when you take a stick and hit somebody, maybe I did wrong but not correcting him. Or maybe I did the right thing but not because normally I would probably do something. And I'm just saying, you have to know motivation. You have to think about who he is. Uh, I've had far more advantages than he had had. 
And so out of love, uh, it was just something you do. Uh, and there have been a lot of things that you've, you have to learn to give because it's for the good of the cause. And that second part that you just mentioned, that's what that's saying. That there are times that uh, you'd rather respond in some other way, but you just can't. You have to think about loving people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, go right back to it for a few minutes now. Spend just a little bit more time. Boy, he says in, uh, let me see, verse 7. Uh, However, now he just said all these things. There is one hope. There is one Lord. There is one this. There is one that. But then he comes down to it and says a word that says, However, he has given each one, each one of us, a special gift through the generosity of Christ. And then he goes on to say that Jesus came to earth, he went back, but in so doing, the Holy Spirit gives the gifts. And we're going to read these things, that these gifts. Now, this is where I want you to be. I want you to be thinking now. It's right out of the scripture. He says that everybody has something to give back. I want you to hear there are different gifts listed in different places, but the ones we're reading, I want to read them and I want you to think about each one of them. Doesn't mean you're going to have all of them. Doesn't mean you got any of them. Because there are all kinds of gifts listed. But I'm telling you, you can do something for the cause that I can't do. I can do something you can't do. And when you're talking about a body, it's like we said, it takes the body working together. Ears, nose, mouth, feet, legs, all of it. Inner workings as well. So here's what he says. I'm skipping down now to verse 11. These are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles. Now we're talking there about what? The 12. Or extended. Then say the twelve, he says apostles. There were more than twelve apostles. Barnabas was an apostle. James, the half-brother of Jesus, was an apostle. An apostle was one a missionary sent out. Barnabas was an apostle. Now, he wasn't one of the twelve, but neither was Paul. But Paul said, speaking of himself and Barnabas, we weren't one whit behind the twelve. And that didn't mean they were all perfect because Paul himself confronts Peter and says, you're definitely wrong in what you're doing when he began to refuse to eat with the Gentiles when there were Jews around. But he said, I have appointed some men as apostles. And so many of them were inspired men. Now, I also had prophets. Now, a prophet is not just one who prophesies the future. He, he speaks out for the Lord. So in some sense, I guess a man could be an apostle one sin. He could be a prophet in the sense that he preaches. Now that's possible in the way the words are used. And then he goes on and he says, evangelists. I take it that's the traveling missionaries and the pastors and teachers. Now, in some translations, it has pastor slash teacher, one person there, a pastor teacher, uh, which is pretty much what I've always considered myself, a pastor teacher. Uh, that's, that's, I think, the most gift I have is a pastor teacher. Now, that's extremely important for, for that is, in a sense, the general organization of the church. But now hear the rest of it and hear it clearly. For then it says, their responsibility, who? These people who have 
these appointments, these gifts, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. And always, it just naturally, most people fall into the idea that the preacher and the elders do all the work. That's not true. That's not what this says. Paul says there are people who can train you. There are people who can help you develop for the doing the work of the church. Now, where does that put it? On the people who make up the body. Not just their elders are the pastors of spiritual life and not bosses. Preachers are not the clergy in the sense of, well, in the sense they are where we use it and what they do. But he's saying, if you're going to do something, train people. I spent the last 20 years of my life out of administration, but working with younger preachers nearly every day, helping them, being a mentor, trying to help them see their role. And, and trying to get you to understand that these elders now are to be the sh shepherds for the sheep, that's us. But as sheep, we can learn and we can do and we can function because those who have been gifted in special ways are to help us, to train us. I mentioned so much about the Volte Church. I think for me, one of the greatest churches ever. Uh, and we spent years training teachers where the educational program of the Volte Church was, I thought, a tremendous power in this world. Teaching them to carry out the work of the church. And that's what he's talking about here. So, there's a reason for it. Right on down, verse 14. Then, we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we'll speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. He's the head, we're the body, we're the workers, and we need to be trained to do our work. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work. Special work, why? Whatever God's chosen you to do. You need to decide who you are, what part of the body you are, and function. Own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And that's our stopping part tonight, point tonight, right there. That we have a calling and we answer the call and we are to be trained to function as our part of the body, whatever it is. It may be just being a mother. It may be just, just as about as good as you get. It may be mean being a great cook and sharing your skills. It may mean being a teacher. It may mean singing. It may be whatever, cutting the grass. It may be this, whatever. But we all function. It may just be talking to a neighbor and saying, can I help you? Or, I love you. Or, expressing ourselves or inviting them to study with you, whatever. Not trying to force you into some mold that you don't fit but a discovery of who you are and get people to help you become even better at what you have a natural talent for.